Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, May 31st, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, social media giants team up to fight hate speech in the name of security. Then, what happened to the Libertarian Party? After that, the war between the press and politicians. That's next. Speaking of the lack of violence on the right, Trump had a, a biker rally for veterans um, in celebration of Memorial Day this weekend. I was in D.C., 700,000 to a million bikers descending on the city. Not a single violent incident. No, no. rest. Just but they're calm. still going to try and push that narrative. Well, we have been witnessing an assault on free speech at college campuses across the nation, uh, kind of putting that warning sign out there of where is this thing headed? Well, now we have to be worried about the fact that tech giants are circumventing the Constitution and now aligning with foreign governments in order to tackle online hate speech. So this is a new initiative. Uh, the European Union has actually reached an agreement with some of the biggest social media firms like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Yahoo, other tech giants, Google, Microsoft, and they have pledged to tackle online hate speech in less than 24 hours. It's part of a joint commitment to combat the use of social media by terrorists. So they're saying beyond even these national laws that will criminalize hate speech, there's a need to ensure that such activity by Internet users is expeditiously reviewed by online intermediaries and social media platforms. Now, we thought that they were already doing this. Uh, with Twitter, we saw that they had created their Trust and Safety Council. And of course, those groups, they're not just across the board looking for terrorists. They are going specifically after the groups that they dislike or that they disagree with, like a lot of conservatives out there, anyone who would dare speak out against the current feminist movement here. And so they've created a code of conduct. And this is, they're saying that, you know, they're bringing it up as it's coming in the wake of the bloody attacks in Paris as well as in Brussels by Islamic State. But these aren't the groups that are being targeted. We see that they're working freely online. Uh, the the groups, groups who have been targeted are people who are speaking out against the refugee invasion there in Europe. And now let's take a little flashback to when Matt Drudge was here in studio and he was very prescient with this warning. And you had the Justice Stephen Breyer said we need to look at a global law. Now, remember just recently he getting had a book it lined came up out. with it. So they're getting ready for these decisions to come. You thought Obamacare was shocking. You thought some of these other decisions were shocking. Wait until these copyright laws work their way up and the Supreme Court decides you cannot have a website with news headlines linking across the board. Then that will end for me. Fine. I've had a hell of a run. It's 20 years next year or 20 years about now. Hell of a run. I couldn't I couldn't have gone any further farther. I feel completely I have gone as far out of the galaxy as I can on this. I still want to stay out here, but I've gone pretty damn far for what one individual can do in this culture. But I'm talking about the future. So I don't know why they've been successful in pushing everybody into these little ghettos of these Facebooks and these tweets and uh, these Instagrams, these Instas. This is ghetto. This is ghetto. This is corporate. They're taking your, they taking your energy. They're taking your energy and you're getting nothing in return. Nothing. They're dumbing the language down. Twitter's designed to reduce the language directly out of 1984. It's Ingsoc. So Matt Drudge was here to say time to get out of these internet ghettos because just like that, with just the flip of a switch, anything that you're, you've built and created online can be taken away from you at someone else's discretion uh, based on these arbitrary rules of what is or is not offensive. Sirius XM has just announced that Glenn Beck's show has been suspended over recent comments made by one of his guests, Brad Thor. Uh, as we've talked about last week, Brad Thor was on there saying, you know, what what patriot is going to take out a President Trump? Now, I can't imagine if someone had said that exact same thing about President Obama. Of course, they immediately would have come after them. Glenn Beck, he didn't he didn't stop and say, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, we, we mean politically take out, not, you know, some patriot taking out the president. That's kind of a call to violence. Glenn Beck denies that, of course. 
Uh, but that's just one example of the kind of sweeping power that we are giving these tech giants. Uh, radio, you know, it's just something like five companies control it all. And so now we're trying to figure out what exactly constitutes offensive speech. Um, you know, Glenn Beck is out, but here we have a video of a three-year-old girl who is saying we have to kill Donald Trump. So this is totally fine to train your kids up in this way. We're going to kill Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, is that a fact? Why are we going to kill Donald Trump? Why is he bad? <laughs> That's mean, huh? Yeah. Mean Donald Trump. Yeah. So what are we gonna do? <laughs> so we are completely screwed as a country if this is the kind of way that we are raising the next generation. Um, as we can see in schools, they're already being trained to hate this country, hate what the West stands for calling for something entirely new, something that they don't even entirely understand because they refuse to educate themselves on actual history and not just cherry-picked ideas of what worked and what didn't work many, many times, but will work this time around. And now we actually have a uh, Louisiana state Democrat, Barbara Norton, coming out saying that she doesn't want kids uh, in as grades four, five, and six to learn the Declaration of Independence because she says it's racist. It was written in a time when people had slaves, so no, not all men are created equal. And as many people have pointed out, no, it was not perfect back then. People did have slaves. However, this document was a means to encourage humanity toward a certain ideal, which of course, I think we've done a very good job uh, in the present day, but people don't wanna look at that. They don't wanna recognize how far we've come. They just wanna say it was racist, and forget about the fact that this is the greatest country ever, thanks to what the Founding Fathers put in place. They want to destroy that and completely make people, especially young people, not understand their history. So, you know, this is the freedom of speech that makes the United States great. So we have to start asking, who is it that gets to decide what people are allowed to say? We have some young activists really coming out and trying to uh, be the new rulers of everything. So this is a pretty influential group. We have the National Union of Students, and it's a black students conference. Uh, there was a, a young woman just elected to be the black students officer, uh, Malia Buwadia. She was elected president of the union. And some of the, here, here's what she is proposing. She wants to abolish all prisons because they are racist and sexist. And this is, of course, pointing to the high rates of reoffending and disproportionate number of black people in jail. She concludes, prisons are sexist and racist. Now, this is the same person who has also previously argued that it is Islamophobic to oppose ISIS. And she even described one university as a Zionist outpost because it has a large Jewish society. So you're not allowed to exist if you're just Jewish, but if you like ISIS, that's totally fine. And so this is a girl that was just elected president of the National Union of Students Black Students Conference. There she is the president. So leader with these type of viewpoints. And the thing is, is that we're now starting to witness that it's gotten so extreme and it's never enough. People can never be offended. And once you correct, you allow them to correct your speech even just a little bit. It's the whole give them an inch, they take a mile, so they're gonna continue pushing on. And now we're seeing the political insanity of the left actually eating their own, fighting against their own. Uh, Hillary Clinton was criticized last week for not responding to trans-focused questionnaire that was sent to her by Trans United. Uh, it's a political action committee pushing transgender uh, political issues, most notably the bathroom legislation. They said, you know, Bernie Sanders, good job. He was praised because he completed the questionnaire. But then meanwhile, he was interrupted. The, the Secret Service actually had to storm the stage and protect him because five activists from Direct Action Everywhere, which is a radical animal rights organization, rushed the stage. And they said, you know, he's really progressive. He promotes himself, progress progressivism and rejecting discrimination and inequality. But when it comes to the animals in the U.S. and around the world, Discrimination and violence is the name of the game every single day. He claims to be progressive, but you can't be progressive if you oppose animal rights. 
And so that's what they're saying. You're progressive, but it's not enough. You have to do even more. And so once again, they storm the stage. Now we remember what happened last time we had some activists storm the stage there. Bernie just stood back. And then of course he made his entire platform against the issues that these young radical activists are really pushing for. And so they are wanting him to recognize radical activism as a means to get things done. So th this right there is of course very scary. Now one of the things that you're hearing at a lot of these uh, anti-Trump protests and everything is just the racism. Trump is so racist and he's sexist, xenophobic and everything and how dare he want to vet refugees coming in from these countries where we don't know if they are potential terrorists or not. Well, is it racist to close our borders or vet people that could be carrying a contagious, infectious disease? This is something that the country has always done. You can't come into this country if you're carrying an infectious disease. Uh, but now they are reporting that uh, a disfiguring tropical disease is sweeping across the Middle East. Uh, this is cutaneous leishmaniasis. It's transmitted through bites from sand flies, and it can result in horrible open sores as well as disfiguring skin lesions, nodules, or papules if left untreated. So it gets in your bloodstream, and of course, it can be transmitted from person to person uh, via coughing, uh, blood transfusions, of course, uh, bodily fluids. So this is something that's really affecting these regions that are fleeing uh, their countries and into Europe, but that's racist. I'm not supposed to say that. We should be just like Germany, who is experiencing uh, 18 women allegedly sexually assaulted at a music festival this weekend, and they were able to, uh, to catch three uh, asylum seekers from Pakistan aged between 28 and 31 because they were able to quickly intervene. However, they say there could be more people who took part in these attacks because as we've seen, what they do is they surround women by a huge group of men and then they sexually assault them when they're in these large groups. Or we could be like Sweden, who is now toying with the idea of creating women-only swimming pools uh, to deal with their rising uh, immigrant population there. They want to be accommodating to them and have women only swimming pools because women and men are not allowed to fraternize. I guess it could keep the raping down, but that's how it is. It's like no assimilation from on their part. It's the entire country has to assimilate to their way of living and a very aggressive way of living, if you ask me. And we also are getting a moral response from the Dalai Lama, right? And you would think the Dalai Lama would say, you know, look into the face of every single refugee, see the children and the women, and you can feel their suffering. And it's the duty of a human being who is more fortunate to help them. But check this out. The Dalai Lama says, even on the other hand, there are too many now. Europe, for example, Germany cannot become an Arab country. Germany is Germany. There are so many that in practice, it becomes difficult. From a moral point of view, I think that the refugees should only be admitted temporarily. The goal should be that they return and help rebuild their countries. So this is the Dalai Lama. He's <laughs> dedicated his entire existence to enlightened thinking. And this is coming from him, someone who, you know, dedicates himself to helping the less fortunate out there. Even he can see the writing on the wall. So what is the madness that we are doing with just importing people willy nilly and calling people racist if they want to vet them for being a potential terrorist or carrier of an infectious disfiguring disease, I might add. So this is of course something that Trump has been at war with uh, a lot of people here in this country and elsewhere, but he's also now at war with the press who he's been having to push back against them calling him racist, uh, sexist, homophobic, even though he never made those comments. But now they're also calling him out saying, hey, what did you do with all of those, that $6 million you said you raised for veterans? As you recall, he had that rally there for veterans rather than doing the, the debate. Well, here's how he responded to a reporter's question. I'm not looking for credit, but what I don't want is when I raise millions of dollars, have people say like this, sleazy guy right over here from ABC. He's a sleaze in my book. You're a sleaze because you know the facts and you know the facts well. Go ahead. 
So he calls this guy sleazy because he's calling out the media saying, I see how you guys work, I know how you operate, and I'm going to cut you down if you try and roll this out. So he is sitting there explaining, I've sent a million dollars here, a hundred thousand dollars there, that they had to vet these groups because you can't just have a charity going, hey, we're a veterans charity, give us a hundred thousand dollars. And so he's sitting there naming off all the charities and he, he said, up, up to now, we've given $5.6 million. And then the, the reporter responds and, and lambasts him. And so he's like, dude, you're totally sleazy. And so he says, you know, I think the political press is among the most dishonest I've ever seen. And I have to tell you that because I think the political press, I see the stories and the way they're couched. And then the press asked him, is this the way you're going to treat us when you're president? And he said, yeah, it is. So I think we can see a lot more of the establishment media fighting against the Trump presidency. But we're going to also see a lot of pushback. Meanwhile, you know, what has Hillary Clinton's foundation done for Haiti? There's still 80 uh, something thousand people living in tents. Meanwhile, her foundation has been able to build a really nice resort and a nice new uh, Marriott hotel and things like that. While all the Haitians that they raised billions of dollars are still homeless four or five years later, they have no jobs. So it's absolutely ridiculous. But meanwhile, let's lambast Trump, who actually has donated nearly six million dollars to veterans groups and say, well, he didn't do it quick enough or transparent enough. Why don't you demand some transparency from the Clinton Foundation and then we'll talk. Now, stick around because coming up, I'm going to have Margaret Howell in studio for the News Blitz. And then David Knight will be joining me to break down the craziness in the Libertarian Party. Welcome back. Now joining me in studio is Margaret Howell. She is a former RT correspondent and now host of the Lip TV, joining us for the News Blitz. Hi, Welcome. Man. Thank you for having me. It's exciting. Well, okay. let's get into it. I mean, so many great stories out there showing you the insanity of what is going on in the United States today. <laughs> Now, one of the things that we're dealing with a lot here is just uh, you know, assault on the freedom of speech. We're seeing this left and right at college campuses, institutions of higher learning across the United States, which is just insane. Uh, but now there's a big story on the Drudge Report about the tech giants, um, Google, Twitter, YouTube, all now working with the European Union mm -hmm. to tackle this issue of hate speech online. So uh, they're saying, you know, free speech isn't hate speech. What do we think about that when you're now working a code of conduct with a foreign government? Right. They're wanting to sanitize um, any speech that they don't like and make it illegal. That's what's happening. And it was surprising to me, one of the, the groups that are engaged in this suit, it's France's Jew Jewish Union, Student Union Group. And it looks like, I mean, no offense, but y'all got bigger problems than this right now, frankly. <laughs> um, you know, France is under siege. It has one, it has one of the largest Jewish populations, populations in Europe. And they're fleeing in mass numbers. They've lost nearly half of, of their population in the past 15 years. They have an internal refugee crisis going on. And this is, the, this is what this group has decided to target. I mean, everybody is annoyed with Holocaust deniers and homophobes on YouTube, me included. But... Uh, Seriously, we might have a bigger issue on the table than censoring right. the homophobe on YouTube or the sexist. I know you probably dealt with this. We yeah. all get our fair share of hate online, but you know, we've got free speech in this country. Right. And that's one of the big things that makes this country so great. And we're seeing it continuously under assault. And the fact that I'm looking at this now, they're working with the EU. So we have these huge corporations that are basically a, a public utility at this point, mm -hmm. going around the laws, the, the Constitution, to work on combating hate speech. And so now we've seen on Twitter, they've created their Trust and Safety Council, uh, which was, of course, made up of like Anita Sarkeesian and other groups who they're not targeting everyone and people's speech equally. Mm -hmm. It's like their own little pet project that they're involved in, the, the feminist movement, um, for instance, and then they'll immediately shut down conservative groups or anyone that speaks out against their little pet project. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, ISIS and these other terrorist groups or, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, people putting out this, a whole different kind of hate speech. They're just... Mm -hmm. You know, they're out there free to roam. You and I were talking about this off camera. Um, 
uh, speaking of ISIS being able to use social media on that platform, however they see fit, uh, there was a story that was picked up by the Washington Post where an ISIS fighter who was actually a German national uh, was trying to sell his Yazidi sex slaves on Facebook. Apparently he needed the cash. He was trying to get one um, sold for 8000 It was eventually taken down. But he's okay. Whatever he wants to say, this this uh, German national given, given refugee status is now in Iraq trying to sell his sex slaves on Facebook. He's fine. But, um, you know, if, if you're a Trump supporter, if you have anything to say in, in regards to being pro-life, you're a bigot and a hater, you have to go. You might also find yourself the target of an IRS audit as mm. well as just being shut down. Yeah, no, and they will shut you down expeditiously. It doesn't violate their terms of service. We also did a report a few months back where they had ISIS fighters were selling weapons. I mean, huge military tanks, weapons on Facebook, and you're reporting the page, reporting the page, and it stays up, or showing ISIS beheading videos and things like that. And so so that's the big issue is who gets to decide what is racist, what needs to be banned. And just to kind of give you a little idea about how the world is upside down, uh, we have, for instance, a state rep, a Louisiana state Democrat, saying that she doesn't want school children to be taught the Declaration of Independence because it's racist. So, I mean, <laughs> and probably okay. hate speech as well. Um, how dare we? How dare we think that we have this idea, this concept of the independence? The Bill of Rights, for that matter, that's probably racist too while we're yeah. at it. Do we Yeah, because name? it was created so long ago. And we should probably put her on blast while I'm thinking about it. <laughs> State Rep Barbara Norton, she opposes this new bill that would mandate school children be reading the Declaration of Independence to understand. Now, obviously, everyone knows back when this was written, the country wasn't great at that time. Yes, people had slaves, but it was sort of the hallmark to show people the direction they needed to be going. Mm -hmm. And it's powerful and it's wonderful. Why do you think people are dying to get here on rafts? And now there are so many people that are being taught in schools that this country is terrible and that we need to do away with what we've created here. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, now we have a student group, the National Union of Students. She was speaking at the Black Students Union Conference and she was calling for prisons to be banned because they are racist and sexist and that demanding all criminals be freed. She's also a very outspoken anti-Semitic, and she says uh, universities are Zionist outposts because if they have a large Jewish society. So we, we're seeing an assault that's, in my opinion, really unprecedented. We, we haven't seen it in quite some time like this on, on the Jewish people. And it was shocking to me, taking this back for a second, that we would see a student group be on the wrong side. But, you know, just, just in this case, you know, we're taking this, we're losing them incrementally. So hate speech, we're making the Declaration of Independence hate speech. What's next? What's next? We're going to be doing this show underground if this keeps going <laughs> Yeah, and we will do this show underground. But, and that's, you know, we did, talked about uh, one of the ISIS jihadi recruiting magazines, their big glossy propaganda magazines that they have. And one of the uh, things that they were kind of offering up this advice to people out there who are wanting to recruit for jihad uh, they were saying that these young students, these activists on campus are like the perfect place to go because they are fighting the common enemy, which is the West. Right. And the ability to think for yourself. You know, we, we don't really want educated people and we certainly don't want people thinking for themselves. But that's interesting to, to think that you could radicalize on a college campus more easily than any other place. Um, just talking about, in the spirit of, of saying things that are a little bit outlandish, I want to take you to this story about Eric Holder. The Guardian picked up this story. Eric Holder apparently was found praising Edward Snowden. And I nearly fell out of my seat when I read this. And just to take you to his quote, I don't have a quote card, but just he says that basically um, Edward Snowden performed a public service by raising the debate that we engage in and by, you know, needing these changes to talk um, about to government talk surveillance. About them pr precisely. <laughs> and now, no, he's just to clarify, he doesn't like Edward Snowden. Let's, <laughs> let's not fall on the right side of history here. We, we shouldn't do that. Um, he says that he's not saying that what he did wasn't inappropriate and illegal um, because those those were inappropriate and illegal things, you know, telling people the truth that you should never do that as, as a practice in general. Um, Taking those words from Eric Holder, inappropriate and illegal, yeah. do you recall the Fast and Furious where we saw 14 DOJ yeah. um, members, if you will, officials not charged, 
uh, not criminalized for for mass criminal activity, yeah. losing two thousand guns. Nothing to see over hand. here. Nothing to see there. But Edward Snowden, you're not only inappropriate and illegal. Um, yeah. You make some good points though, and you fall into the public. You know, the public discourse. It's been raised because of you. Right. What a joke. Well, and you see a lot of these people. Uh, even Obama is kind of starting to uh, go this route. Once they're out of office and they're back in the real world, and they have to worry about their families and their children growing up in the world that they're helping to create, mm -hmm. they're realizing too wow, this surveillance, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And they're going to come after me. They're going to come after my children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we might want to rein it in a little bit mm -hmm. because, you know, they're not... But yeah, Eric Holder coming out with Edward Snowden, you know, running guns across the border is uh, not illegal. It's totally okay in this Wally world that we're living mm -hmm. in. What is happening here? You know, Eric Holder, the forever moral standard bearer of, of all things right. Doesn't he work for the financial services industry now? Yeah. He's representing big banks and and um, he's definitely continuing on that path of just... Yeah, well, this is what you do. You sort of set yourself up for what's next. And so this is the world we're living in. We're actually now starting to see the left turning against their own. These extreme leftist groups are going after Bernie Sanders, storming his stage as well as Hillary Clinton. We saw uh, the Sanders stage stormed uh, the, for the first time with the Black Lives Matter. We actually had to step aside and just let protesters talk at his rally because <laughs> that's what you do, I guess, when you're Bernie Sanders. Speaking of the lack of violence on the right, Trump had a, a biker rally for veterans um, in celebration of Memorial Day this weekend. I was in D.C., 700,000 to a million bikers descending on the city. Not a single violent incident. No, no. rest. Just but they're calm. still going to try and push that narrative that this is where the violence is coming from. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely insane. Well, so good to have you in studio. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Social justice warriors. Forget all of the death threats you have spewed out towards Donald Trump deeming him a bigot simply because you can't swallow the truth. <laughs> Reality is on the verge of entering the comfort zone you so adamantly defend. The tsunami of immigration strategized by Bilderberg elites to divide and conquer the U.S. and Europe is only growing stronger and more dangerous as the days roll by. And now, as London's newly elected pro-caliphate mayor strengthens the foothold of Sharia law, it appears jolly old England may be the first country to completely fall if nothing is done. Breitbart UK reports. Up to half a million migrants and their families who have fled from the Middle East, North Africa, and elsewhere could head to the UK after 2020 under European Union free movement rules. Between 240,000 and 480,000 may travel to UK, and while countries such as Greece, Italy, and Germany have been hardest hit by the migrant crisis so far, a secondary wave will likely move on to Britain once they have the right. Meanwhile, as Obama is challenged by 26 states on the constitutionality of the 2014 DAPA program, the dam has completely burst as a surge of unchecked illegal immigrants entering the United States swells into record numbers. WCQS reports, immigrants fleeing gang violence in Central America are again surging across the U.S.-Mexico border, approaching the numbers that created an immigration crisis in the summer of 2014. While the flow of immigrants slowed for much of last year, nothing the U.S. government does seems to deter the current wave of travelers. Yet the numbers are daunting. From last October to March, the U.S. Border Patrol averaged 330 apprehensions of Central Americans a day, according to an analysis by the Pew Research Center, an increase of 100% over the same time period a year earlier. And it's not just the surging numbers of criminals given the revolving door into the United States, freely killing and yes, raping U.S. citizens or the quiet strengthening of Sharia communities in the United States that is fully underway. We have had Somalians here once they got on that special uh, uh, alien list. Uh, they won't tell us that anymore, but there have been some Somalians, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Chinese, uh, you name it, we've had it here. <laughs> but as one of them was uh, climbing over the fence, he dropped uh, a package. And that package uh, was an 
Urdu dictionary. Urdu is a language uh, spoken in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And in that uh, uh, translation book, Urdu in English, there were a lot of phrases circled and outlined. Do you speak Spanish? Do you speak English? So it's, it's easier for them to slip through this private property. Disease lives inside this Trojan horse. The rates of tuberculosis infections are rising for the first time in nearly 20 years. And the evidence points to people coming from overseas to the United States. Our own investigation has found that everyone, U.S. born or foreign born, who lives in a refugee resettlement area is at risk for contracting tuberculosis. An outbreak of measles, the highly contagious measles that began with an inmate at the Eloy Detention Center has now grown to 11 confirmed cases. And now state, county health officials are working to try to stop it from spreading further. Breitbart reports a flesh-eating tropical disease is ravaging the war-torn Middle East after Islamic State destruction created the ideal breeding conditions. The parasitic disease called cutaneous leishmaniasis, also known as the Aleppo evil, is caused by bites from tiny infected sandflies which thrive in the squalid conditions left in the wake of the Islamic State terror and conflict. The number of cases has shot up from just six in 2012 to thousands just a year later. The U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention reported that the disease has recently begun to flourish in Syria's neighboring countries. The time has come to shut down George Soros' social justice warriors wreaking havoc on the narrative. Freedom of speech is needed now more than ever. Ignorance can't be the darkened midnight path we lead our families and fellow Americans down. This trail winds its way towards certain doom, emboldened by our own inaction. John Bound for Infowars.com. So, Matt, uh, Colonel smith Mac, thank you for coming on. Tosh Plumley's here as well. You guys just pop in and take control uh, here of the broadcast at the bottom of the hour and just get the info out. Because this is, this is short and sweet, not focusing in on the story. Folks know about it. Our audience does. But how to get reportage on the shipment that's about to happen or has happened. Uh, hey, Mr. Jones, it's uh, it's uh, Matt Smith, Mac. Yeah, and I wanted to say also, uh, Kent Terry um, said he'll be listening today. I let him know. Fantastic. About I want to the, thank uh, him for his courage. So, uh, so, yes, so bottom sir, line, uh, tell us about the we, shipment. We, What's about to happen? What do we do? Bottom line, sir, there is uh, you know a shipment went. Uh, we let Congress know, uh, House Oversight, let them know uh, nothing. Nothing. They did not act on that information. So the shipment went, went into Mexico, got on a train, went southeast to a port, and then then God knows where after that. And this was a few, a few so days ago? Because you said it was at the end of the month. This was a few days ago. This would have been this would have been the 23rd okay. of this month. Yes, sir. Because last time you were on, another, you said it was imminent. You weren't exactly sure when. So now it's happened. Weeks. Sure, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, no, go. Yes, sir. Another shipment about in about three weeks or so, three to four weeks. Again, letting Congress know, letting them know there's a... An, an individual willing and able to help them. Uh, Kent Terry knows this person. William Lajeunesse knows this person. All they need to do is engage with this person. And I think they'll, they'll, it, it, it's, it's that one area that the federal government, the executive branch, utilized to execute fast and furious in these kind of operations. But for some reason, the legislative branch seems reticent to want to access this domain that is we have a unique insight and opportunity to get into. So this would blow Fast and Furious, Hillary, the whole system, the kingdom come politically, and Congress won't act on it. Well, sad, sadly, it appears that way. Wow, well, this right, is just such a huge deal, and, and I knew that was coming up at the end of the month, so I wanted to get you on. Uh, so, this, so this has now happened, and it's just ongoing. Have you received any other threats, Colonel? No, no, uh, no other threats. I mean, you know, the the kind of the the, the friendly. Friendly warnings from people who do who do con are concerned, saying, "Hey, you know, back off! You don't want to be found face down in a gutter somewhere." But um, but uh, this is too important. You know, as I said before, in your first time on your show, uh, we're we're citizens, not not subjects. And uh, as a Marine, you know, Brian Terry deserves my full effort and faith to make sure closures come to him and his family. Well, sure. What what, what if they're shipping five year old kids next? which you know the UN does, are we supposed to just let them ship little kidnapped kids out? I mean, how long do we sit here and watch crime committed? Let's go to Tosh Plumley, famous uh, whistleblower. Tosh, you've been helping break this wide open because folks knew you had the courage to talk about it. Uh, what's the bottom line for listeners and viewers out there that Congress stood down and let this happen? 
Okay, let me let me back up here and see if I can get uh, get a little bit of background of how Matt and I got together. Four years ago on your program, we mentioned exactly what we're covering now. We talked about guns going across the border to Mexico, which was all up and over and above Fast and Furious. That Fast and Furious was a cutout for an international gun running operation that was being filtered through Mexico to the Middle East and to, into Gaddafi's bunkers. That's been documented before the fact. We also documented on your program and other programs and on my Facebook page that monies were going back to the Hillary Clinton from foreign donations of people that was receiving weapons from our arsenals that was approved by uh, the direct commercial sales program, Blue Lantern Report. This was all documented. Today, I want to Huffington Post, briefly put out an article uh, that confirmed information that went back four and a half years ago, uh, which was covered on your program and also on John B. Wells' program on Coast to Coast on November the 2nd, 2013. These were documented, uh, vetted information. That information was also, at that point in time, turned over to the U.S. Senate, the Congress, Trey Gowdy, and Grassley in the form of 11 Benghazi questions and made direct references back to the gun running operation, which was legal at that point in time, but it was going across Mexico to the Mexican army. The Mexican army was filtering that some of the percentage of those weapons off and sending those weapons to the drug cartel, which was proven when Joaquin Guzman was arrested and some of those weapons ended up in his safe house. Now, what got the current situation between Matt and I together, his investigation, Terry, Brian Terry's investigation and my investigation, all three dovetail. And welcome back. Joining me in studio now is David Knight. We're going to break down the insanity that has become the Libertarian Party. Now, this weekend they held the Libertarian National Convention, and I got to say, it seems only John McAfee is holding on to the principles of the party. We see him playing the clown, uh, but also playing to the establishment. That's true. And of course, uh, John McAfee is kind of a wild and dangerous character, but he held to the principles more than anybody else. And he even said, hey, am I crazy? I don't, I don't think we can win this, but I can use this to focus attention at the local level. That's really right. what they should be doing with this, is focusing attention at the local level. But at the same time this happened, we had a tweet come out from Bill Kristol, who is part of, I guess you could call him the leader of the Never Trump movement. And he came out with this tweet. He said, just a heads up over this holiday weekend, there'll be an independent candidate, an impressive one with a strong team and a real chance. And so a lot of people said, oh, is he talking about the libertarians? He said independent and he has, he is a neocon. He really hates libertarian principles. But of course, he wants to see Hillary over Donald Trump. So would he throw these out? Is right. this a real issue? Can this happen? And when we took a look at this uh, and we've got the article that's up on uh, Infowars.com, we'll talk about it in just a moment. Is it really going to be a factor in the election? First of all, Leanne, this is a brokered convention, and it always is a brokered convention. They hold their convention quite a bit early because they want to, um, it's really a requirement in order to get 50 state ballot access. And that's what's really valuable about becoming the Libertarian Party nominee. There's not any other party that even comes close to getting 50 state ballot access. This is why the Republican establishment is interested in taking over the Libertarian Party with these two former governors who are rhinos from uh, blue states, if you want to put it that way. Now, it took two ballots for both Johnson and Well to get in. There's a lot of people there who smell a rat. Mm. And we're going to tell you what that rat smells like, what that rat looks like. <laughs> Many of the people in the LP really understand this is a sellout. It's a compromise of the principles of the party. Let's look at what Gary Johnson said back in October, this last October, why I would run for president. Of course, he did this four years ago as a libertarian nominee. What he said in this was he said, unfortunately, Rand Paul, in his quest to have one foot in the libertarian camp and the other in the establishment Republican Museum, has emerged with a vague mix of positions that is clearly not compelling. There is a price to be paid for selling out, and he is paying it. Well, I would say that it's not the uh, keeping one foot in the Republican establishment museum that he's talking about, but Gary Johnson is keeping at least one, maybe more feet, in the Democrat social justice establishment. Right. And he thinks that he's going to get the Bernie Sanders socialists and the Never Trump conservatives to follow him I don't think that's going to happen. No. Take a look at the, his approach of what he's going to do. And of course, this is a story that was up on Infowars.com this weekend. Gary Johnson's plan to beat Trump, simply call him a racist, as if that hasn't been done before. 
And he's actually, according to some early polls, he's actually attracting more votes away from Hillary than Trump. Now, it's too early to know anything in the polls. And of course, these polls were taken before William Weld came on board. However, Johnson continually brags about the connection that he has with Bernie supporters and even with Hillary Clinton. He says, when I take the poll at I side with, he said, I side 73% of the time with Sanders on issues, 63% of the time with Clinton on issues. And of course, Trump, you're not gonna do very well if you take that side. Understand, this is a very biased site. Nine of the questions out of 60 that you can ask, that they'll ask you there, nine of those questions, they say, well, we don't really know what Donald Trump's position is on this. So regardless of whether your answer is yes or no, they're going to say you don't agree with Donald Trump. So you're going <laughs> the max you could get for Donald Trump would be 85%, but for the rest of them, you could get as high as uh, 100%. All right, so they say Trump is ridiculous, but look at what happened at the convention. They've got a guy who put his name in nomination for chair, used it as an opportunity to get his two minutes of fame stripping down to his G-string. And so how do you strip the Libertarian Gosh. Party, not only of its principles of freedom, but also of its dignity and its relevancy? Well, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna strip away the support for the Second Amendment. And the platform, they say, we oppose all laws at any level of government, restricting, registering, or monitoring the ownership and manufacture or transfer of firearms or ammunition. That's not what William Well said when he was asked this by Jake Tapper on CNN. Well, I'm a lifelong hunter and gun owner, and uh, I don't think those proposals were uh, out of the mainstream uh, at all. I distinguish between, uh, you know, hunting, uh, hunting guns and uh, guns that really don't seem to have any hunting purpose or potential purpose. Uh, oh. So that was the distinction I was he drawing agrees there. It's about but, uh, hunting. Yeah. That, that's, uh, now, what that's he was saying, the question about that was, did you propose an assault weapons ban. His response was, well, I'm a lifelong hunter and I distinguish between hunting guns and guns that don't have that purpose. That's what he thinks of the Second Amendment. And yeah, then he goes on to say, read it. that's right, Johnson and I can find common, yeah, there's nothing in the Second Amendment about hunting. So we can find common ground. I guess they can because several libertarian sources are pointing out that after everything, after he got the nomination, the guy who ran second to him presented him with a replica of George Washington's pistol, which he threw in the trash. They retrieved that and gave it back to uh, the second place finisher, Austin Peterson. He's not saying anything about it because it's more important to stand for party unity to get the political side out there than it is to stand for principles anymore. But let's take a look at how they have trashed and stripped the Libertarian Party of another one of its key principles, private property. Though this came up in the debate, we'll call this Nazi cakes. Here's a clip. Governor Johnson has stated that he believes that bakers should be forced to bake wedding cakes for people that they disagree with, homosexual couples. And this is a big problem because we're running for is president. Is he correct in quoting you? Uh, yes, but I think that if you discriminate on the basis of uh, religion, I think that that is a black hole. Look, I think you should be able to discriminate for stink or you're not wearing shoes or whatever. But I'll tell you what, if we discriminate on the basis of religion, to me, that's doing harm to a big class of people. You see how he switches that around? He's talking about discriminating against people because of religion, discriminating against Christian bakers. And of course, the very beginning of the LP platform has always said this, individuals are sovereign over their own lives. No one should be forced to sacrifice his or her values for the benefit of others. And yet Gary Johnson wants to coerce people with government for what he sees as a social benefit. It's actually part of the LGP, uh, LGBT agenda. He went on to say this, and right should, now, a, should a Jewish I baker think, be required to bake a I Nazi wedding Muslims cake? I think Muslims right now in this country, I think this Muslims is, in this country would be banned by all sorts of businesses right now because it would be the popular thing so to do. So the Jewish baker should right. have to bake the cake for the Nazi wedding. That's uh, that would be my contention. There yes, you go. and uh, the <laughs> example that I cited was how about well the example I cited is how about the and uh, booed, utility. But uh, the, the, the utility that ridiculous. is privately owned, and because it's the only, um, it's the only market. Okay, let's that stop I it have. right there. Total non sequitur. He goes off and saying, "Well, what if you had a public utility that wouldn't sell power to somebody because they're gay or because they're Muslim?" I mean, it's an absurd example. And a public utility is Isn't a government granted right monopoly. It? It's but a government granted monopoly. It's not a private property. Right. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about the economy, because what he's doing here socially, they, they say we're socially uh, liberal and we're uh, 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 economically conservative, okay? But what they've done is they've taken the worst of both parties. They've taken the economic fascism of the Republican Party and combined it with the intolerant 
social engineering of the Democrats. But let's talk about globalism because this is what the libertarians don't understand. This is where he is in sync with the rest of the party in terms of free trade and open borders. I want to play this clip of what William Weld, who is now going to be the VP candidate, said about NAFTA. Some of the stuff that he's running on, I think, is absolutely chaotic. Uh, I'm going to do this to Mexico. Okay, that's a violation of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is the supreme law of the land. It's a treaty. We signed it. I'm going to do this to China, no questions asked. Okay, that's a violation of the World Trade Organization rules, exposing us, the United States, to sanctions there. So we would be the rogue nation. Okay, so you understand that he sees these treaties as being the supreme law of the land. They are not the supreme law of the land. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and you can't abrogate that with a treaty. Mm -hmm. But he, see, he wants to subvert us to globalism. And we understand that the way you lose your individual liberty is when the government takes it away. First, it's taken away typically at the local level, then it goes to the state level, then it goes to the national level. That's what the founders of the Constitution were so concerned about. That's called consolidation, it's what they called it. But now it's going to go from that level to the globalist level, to the corporate level, where we don't own or control anything. And that's what these guys support. That is the concern. Wow. And that's really disappointing to me because typically every cycle, I'll just go right down the line, vote yeah. libertarian, but I can't do it on the, on the national level this time. I would have burned my card this weekend if I could have found it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. And thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you here again tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Central.